Welcome, welcome. It is day seven of our seven days of seaweed festival. And I am so, so thrilled to have you guys here this morning on our first session of the day. Um, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Kennedy Nickel and I am a marine biologist and project manager here at Cascadia Seaweed. And I'm going to be your host for today's session. And today's session is unlike any of the other sessions that we've had. It's a two for one. So we are actually going to talk about two different things today. First up, we have Dr. Jennifer Clark. She's the Chief Science Officer at Cascadia Seaweed. And she's going to be sharing lots and lots of fun science with kids and learning all about the great things seaweed has to offer. And now since we have two for one for this session, I wanna let you know that we won't have time to ask Jennifer questions right away. But if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box and follow Cascadia Seaweed on all of our socials. And we'll be posting those with videos of Jennifer answering your questions at another time. So they will get answered and we will celebrate seaweed. Um, but before I let Jennifer begin, I wanna share a little bit about her. Jennifer is a marine phycologist and she has nine years, over nine years, of experience cultivating seaweed and studying the physiology. And so I'll let her tell you a bit more about that. She is passionate about seaweeds as they are a renewable and nutritional food source, beneficial in their effects of reducing carbon emissions and vital in maintaining healthy coastal ecosystems. And without further ado, I would love to welcome Jennifer Clark. Hi, good morning, everybody. I'm um, super excited to be joining here with you today and talking about the science of seaweeds. Um, so as Kennedy uh, mentioned, I'm a phycologist and I'll get into that in just a moment. But I wanted to share my screen. We have lots of videos to share. Um, my job here at, at Cascadia Seaweed is actually to grow all the seaweed that, that goes into our food products. And so I wanted to share what that science is like and, and kind of what, what, what some of those beautiful seaweeds are like. Uh, we'll go into the intertidal and we'll also go through how seaweed is made. And then I have a really cool lab experiment um, that you can have a look at at the end. So with that, I'm just gonna share my screen here. Um, and we'll get that going. Oh, hold on, there we go. Okay. So when I ask kids what, when I say seaweeds, what usually comes to mind? And many of the, many of the, the responses have been like slimy, sticky, ew. Um, you know, there's a very negative connotation to it. Um, but I hope by the end of this presentation, I'll be able to change your mind about um, what, you, what you say about seaweeds. So, what are seaweeds and why are they important? So here we have um, maybe some of the seaweeds that you've seen in the intertidal. Seaweeds are a multicellular organism. They are a marine algae. Um, and usually you can see them as this, this mac they're also called this macroalgae because they're unlike microalgae that you need with a microscope, you can see seaweeds by the naked eye. And here on the BC coast, we have about 600 species of seaweeds in British Columbia. And seaweeds are really important uh, because they, they provide a habitat for, for lots of organisms. Um, so for kelp forests, you'll see sea otters and, and fish and, and lots of invertebrates like worms and snails. And a, and a, a kelp forest and a seaweed, um, a seaweed community actually provides a home for these organisms. They provide food, they provide shelter. And so they're, they're actually really important to make sure that the animals and the organisms that live on our coasts are, have a place to live and, and, and to you know, have a family. So uh, one of these important food chains here, we have, um, I don't know if, if some of you have seen this in class, but we have the giant kelp beds and within the giant kelp beds, sea urchins live in there. And sea urchins are the main food of sea otters. And so what do you think would happen if the sea otters went? 
Well, we know after, we know that once sea otters were almost hunted to extinction, uh, some of our kelp beds actually went missing. And this is because the sea urchins proliferated and ate all the kelp. So we can see that with sea otters, we have beautiful kelp forests and without sea otters, we have these things called urchin barrens. So it's important to keep sea otters in, in, their, in our ecosystems, but it's also important to keep the kelp in our ecosystems because we know that they're home for a lot of, a lot of animals. And so for, to kind of give you an, um, a background, I guess, in, in terms of, you know, I can't bring you to the ocean, but I hope that I could um, share the ocean with you. So I've made a little video here, which I'll share now. Um, about you know some of the seaweeds that you might be able to find in the intertidal. Um, not this one, <laughs> not that one either. Uh, so I just want to check, Kennedy. You can see an, an ocean uh, with the the with the cliffs on the side. It looks beautiful. Okay, we'll start now. Makes me wish I was at the beach. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Jennifer Clark. I'm the Chief Scientist and Phycologist at Cascadia Seaweed. Some might not know what a phycologist is, and phycos in Greek means algae, and ologist means the study of. So I study algae, and particularly I am studying the marine algae, which are commonly more known as seaweed. So during a low tide, it's the perfect time to go and have a look at some of the seaweeds that are found that are found below water. So right now we're at low tide and you can see that there's lots of seaweeds that you can have a look at. So let's check some of them out, some of our local species we have right here in BC. Here we have a member of the brown seaweeds, or more commonly known, this particular one is commonly known as a kelp. Kelps are really long, fast growers. They're, some kelps can actually grow 10 to 30 centimeters in a day. Um, this one here is actually called Cymothera typicata, and we know it's this species because it has these three distinct bands here running along the midrib. So although seaweeds look a little bit like plants, they're not actually true plants in the sense that they have roots, shoots, and leaves, which help land plants to stay upright and photosynthesize in the air. Seaweeds, on the other hand, kind of look like true plants, but they lack the vascular system that brings nutrients up and around in true plants. So here we can see they have kind of similar things. They have a hold fast, and the hold fast it looks like roots, but they don't actually draw in any water because they're already submerged in water. And you can see they kind of have these little root-like structures. And this actually just helps them hold on to a substrate so they don't get flying off with the, with the tides. We then have this kind of more structured thing here, which is called a stipe. And the stipe kind of holds it in the water. In this particular species, we have a midrib and then off the sides we have the, the, the blades. The entire thing would be called a, thala, a thallus. And this entire um, organism can photosynthesize from its, um, from its blades here. Many of you have been to the beach and have probably picked up some of this stuff here. Um, this is called rockweed. You can find it in most places uh, in the intertidal during the low tide. Um, it's, this rockweed here you can see is very distinctive. Uh, it's got these little um, air bladders on the edges. This lets them sit upright in the water and allows them to photosynthesize so they're able to, to gain as much sunlight as possible when the tide comes back in. Um, you can usually pop them, which are kind of fun. These, these are really common in our, in our shores.
So here we have a very iconic CD. Uh, this is called Muriocystis Diana, uh, commonly more known as Bull Kelp. You can see here that this one's unfortunately got dislodged, so it's been put into this, this pool where it's kind of living for now. Um, so this, this seaweed has the, the blades, the thala. You can see there's some very distinct patches here. These distinct patches are the development of the saurus. And the saurus is what these spores come out of. So the spore, this means that this seaweed is reproductive and soon it will be making uh, little spores that will turn eventually again into another seaweed. Seaweed, the boat kelp has uh, this thing that looks like a stem, but it's actually called a spike. And very distinguishing of a seaweed, uh, some species have this thing called a pneumatocyst. And the pneumatocyst is filled with air. Some of you may have found some at the beach. And if you step on them, they give a nice big crack and uh, usually air is actually um, escaped. There's a, a really well known, or at least some research has been done in the past, that this pneumatocyst has enough carbon monoxide to kill a chicken. And then more recently, there's enough carbon monoxide to kill a human. So don't stand too close when you pop these things. The other thing you'll notice it's, is that this air bladder actually will hold the seaweed up, right, in the, in the water column. And because these guys, you can see how far they're actually attaching down to the, the substrate, they need to photosynthesize. And this pneumatocyst will actually help them stay upright. So all their, their thalli can actually photosynthesize so that's one really cool kelp that we have here in the BC coast. So here we have two different species of red seaweed or rhodophyta. Remember there's three groups, green, brown, and red. Um, here we can see this is called uh, Codricanthus. It's also called Turkish towel because when you look kind of close to it, got all these bumps and you can actually if you dry it you can clean your face with it it's actually really lovely um, this other one here is called Masiella splendens or the rainbow seaweed um, we know it's Masiella because this particular seaweed has a very good stretch to it and when you look at it underwater it has a really uh, lovely opalescence or iridescence so it's kind of shimmery underwater This little guy here is called Halisakion, or nature's squirt gun. If you give it a little squeeze, water will come out, which is kind of fun. So here we have a nori type seaweed. Even though the seaweed uh, looks like it's brown, it's actually a part of the red seaweed group. So there are rhodophyta. This particular seaweed is actually uh, is related to the sushi seaweed, so the ones that you actually eat with sushi uh, that's grown in Japan. But this species is a local species and it's, um, it's perforated, so it naturally has these holes in it. These ones are a little bit more difficult to identify. There's lots of different ones like these, but these are kind of common in our coast. Um, and you can, uh, in some places you can actually eat this. I wouldn't eat it straight from here, but um, they're, they're pretty cool and pretty, pretty, they like to sit in areas that have got lots of nutrients. So uh, there's green, Alva. So thanks for hanging out in the intertidal with me today. I hope you learned some cool new things about some seaweeds that we've looked at today. And the next time you're in the intertidal, you'll be able to find some of these really cool ones we've talked about. So until next time, stay seaweed curious. 
Okay, so I'm going to share my screen again. I hope um, some of you have seen some of those um, seaweeds in the intertidal. I guess the next thing I wanted to talk about was um, who here likes to eat seaweeds? And some people really love to eat seaweeds. I actually really like to eat seaweeds. And in most cases, you'll, you'll probably have eaten seaweeds out of a package. So maybe out of um, like a seaweed snack. I'm actually holding up, um, I'm holding up, I don't know if you can see me at all, but I'm holding up some seaweed snacks here. Some of you might've been able to eat seaweed out of miso soup, but I bet for those of you who have never eaten seaweed, um, I can probably tell you right now that you probably eat seaweed about five times a day. And you eat it not necessarily in a snack form, but in other products. So I'm gonna let you have a look at these images here. We have ice cream, toothpaste, uh, almond milk, and like face cream. Do you think, which ones do you think actually contain seaweeds? And I'll give you like, have a little discussion there. All right, so does ice cream have seaweed in it? They do, they for sure do. Toothpaste does, uh, almond milk does. Actually, all these products that we have here in, on the screen actually contain seaweed, but not necessarily in a form like your seaweed snacks. It's in a form of an alginate. And these are some of the byproducts that we can make out of seaweed. And these, these alginates actually help thicken uh, foods like ice cream or, or almond milk or toothpaste. So for those who don't eat seaweed every day, you actually are eating seaweed every day. You just don't know it. So the next video I wanna show you is, how do you think you get your seaweeds from the ocean to your snack? So I'm just going to open up this, um, this video here. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> oh, technology. <laughs> Here we go, share, get rid of that one. Um, Kennedy, can you just tell me which screen you can see here? Uh, right now you are not sharing your screen. Okay. As you're, as you're figuring out the technology for this, can you tell us if I'm at the beach, do you have any resources for identifying seaweed? If I'm not a seaweed expert, how can I know what I'm looking at? For sure. So you can uh, you can use a seaweed app called the Seaweed Sorter. Um, this is by a really well-known uh, phycologist named Dr. P uh, Patrick Martone. You can find it on your phone. There's also lots of seaweed books. There's one called the Pacific Seaweeds um, book by Dr. Louis Jewell and Bridget Clarkston. Uh, and there's also a plethora of little of little guides that are around. You can probably find them in most um, bookstores. Perfect. All and right. I can see your video really, really well. Great. Okay. Ready when you well, are. <laughs> so this video is about how to make uh, get the seaweed from the ocean into your snacks. First, we need to go and collect some seaweeds to get spores. Then we put it in a tank and wait until we cut them out. Those dark spots is the sori, and that's where we get the spores from. Here we have a different kelp. It's called Alaria, and it has different sori. You can see here the darker patches of the sori. After letting them dry a little bit, we get these spore prints, which means they're ready to produce spores. Then we put it in some water and give it a little stir. Here we're looking at the babies underneath a microscope to make sure that they're doing okay. 
three weeks later, baby kelps. Right now we're in one of the kelp nurseries. So right behind me we have spools that have got string wrapped around them. And growing on the string is some baby kelps. I'm just gonna... So here we can see lots of little babies. And these guys are probably about uh, a month old. And this particular seaweed is called sugar kelp. And so when they are big enough, which they are big enough, they go out on a boat. And on the boat, they get planted like seeds in a field in the water. And then in the water, that's where they grow. All right, so after they get, um, they're grown on the lines, we will harvest them. So they'll take them off the lines and then they'll go to a food processing plant where they get dried and cleaned and prepared for your food. So that's how we get our seaweeds from the ocean into your snack. So the last video that I wanted to share with you um, is a really cool lab experiment that maybe you can even do um, with some of, uh, with your parents. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna go through these, these slides here, whoops. Um, and it was really exciting to do this experiment with one of our, our communications managers' um, kids. So I will just share this video now. Um, all right. Can we see Science for Kids movie, Kennedy? Not yet. All right, great. <laughs> <laughs> Need to share screen, I think. There we go. We'll get through this uh, COVID one day. <laughs> we can see it perfectly. Wonderful. Okay, here we go. Cool lab experiment. Hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer Clark. I'm the chief scientist and a phycologist at Cascadia Seaweed. Today, we're going to do some cool lab experiments with some seaweed. I have my assistants here. My name is Abby. Abby and? Claire. And what's your favorite thing about seaweed? Their taste. <laughs> They're super tasty. Now, what's your favorite seaweed? Have you ever seen them in the ocean? Uh, we always see seaweed in the ocean, mm -hmm. but I don't even know what the ones that I eat in the packages are called. Oh, right. Have you ever seen them in the, in the, in the intertidal and brought them up? And, yeah. Yeah, so they, are they the kelps, the one with the bulb? Um, like sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. yeah, they're pretty tasty and they're pretty cool to pop too, yeah. aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to bring out some seaweeds. We're going to see a really cool thing happen. Ready? This one I just collected today. This is um, maybe one you haven't seen before, but this one's called Cymera triplicata. That's its scientific name, and you can see it has three yeah. kind of mid ribs That's on there. Yeah. Like and what what color do you think this is? Like sort of like a darkish green brown. A brown, yeah. So it's a part of the brown group of seaweeds called Phaeophyceae, and um, kelps are a part of a group called Laminarians. So I have two here. What we're going to do is we're going to put it in some hot water and we're going to see if something really cool happen and I'll tell you what happens. 
So I'm just gonna get you girls to stay back for just two seconds. And then I'm going to put this into our boiling pot of water. And it's very hot. Now, um, for kids at home, please make sure you have some parents to help you with this if you want to try this at home. I'm going to actually put this into the pot. And you can almost see instantly, you can almost see instantly how green it's already turned, right? Look at that. It's green. So now I'm going to put it in some cold water to help it to help it cool down really quickly. We got sounds like someone's at the door trying to knock. <laughs> now look at that here. I now, thought that would take like 30 minutes. I know, me too. So do you know what's happened here? I'm just going to take the other guy out so you can wow. see that complete difference. So this is the original. How did that do that? And this is the new one. So what happens, we know that land plants and seaweeds actually have chlorophyll A in them. And what makes this guy brown, he's got brown pigments and the brown pigments actually help them do different things. And when they're boiled, that brown pigment actually disappears. And so all we can see left is this green part and that's why it's, it's green now. So this is actually an important step when we make food, we need to blanch it first. So it makes that lovely green color. So after processing a little bit, maybe we'll dry it. This is ready to eat. So there you go. That's a fun lab experiment, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah? Let's have dance because we love all the kelp. Yeah. And what are we going to do? We're going to kelp the planet. Okay, um, so I really hope you enjoyed uh, learning a little bit of science involved in, in making seaweed food and kind of the biology. I think that's all the time I have today. Um, I'd love to hear from you any questions you have about how seaweed ends up on your plate and any kind of biology or science questions you have. So thanks for joining me today and thanks for having me, Kennedy. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jennifer. We're going to kelp the planet. Kelp the planet. <laughs> I learn something new every single time I talk to you. Oh, and okay. I hope you guys all at home right now are going to try that experiment. Go to your beach, collect some kelp. I know I'm probably going to do that tonight for the long weekend. So thank you so much for joining us, Jennifer. And we'll be sure to answer, have all your questions answered that you have sent us. And Jennifer will be getting back to you. So stay tuned. Follow Cascadia on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and be, be sure to look out for those. Welcome our part two of this two-in-one session. Uh, Ryan McKee from which I could say that forever. LMNO, it's so fun. So I would like to introduce Ryan. Um, he's a seasoned award, seasoned and award-winning brand builder whose current challenge is creating the next great kids plant-based food brand. He's a recent graduate of Simon Fraser University's executive MBA program. Ryan has embarked on his first entrepreneurial venture, Elemino, whose vision is to give parents time back in their day by delivering healthy, inclusive, plant-based food for the young children. Elemino's values are to be inclusive, thoughtful, and real. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ryan McKee. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, this is super exciting and um, First off, want to uh, just acknowledge 
the work that uh, you guys have put in over the last week, a week's worth of sessions is pretty phenomenal um, with, with Zoom and, and everything going on. So uh, congratulations, you're in the home stretch, I guess. So um, hopefully this is a bit, you know, kind of fun and, and informative and uh, yeah, we'll kind of ease into our Sunday. So um, let me share a screen here. And thanks for the intro. <laughs> um, okay, let's present this here. So I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about LMNO and, and kind of what it is and, and uh, where I, I got to um, in terms of building this, this concept and, and launching the business. Um, but, uh, and then also kind of leave you with just some sort of tips that I've found uh, both with my family. Uh, this is us here. Uh, I'm the one on the right. It's a dad joke there. Um, so we, uh, you know, we incorporate a ton of obviously plants and, and vegetable, you know, vegetables and fruits and all sorts of things into our um, daily routine, our weekly routine. I'm actually vegan, but my, the rest of my family isn't. And so, you know, we go through uh, challenges in terms of, well, what's for dinner and, and what are we going to pack and um, how are we going to make food that, that's sort of um, <clears throat> interesting and uh, delicious and of course, nutritious for everyone. So um, yeah, as my intro, I, I kind of worked in the sports industry for about 20 years. I, uh, uh, the Canucks and the Whitecaps and Mount Equipment Co-op and a bunch of um, roles in, around there. And uh, and then I just sort of hit a moment where I said, I'm, I'm just going to go try and create something on my own and see if I can uh, completely change my career path a little bit and, and um, have fun with it. So um so Elemento, uh, this is something uh, I spent the last year sort of putting together and it launched about two, uh, two months ago, I guess. And fundamentally, it's a healthy, hassle-free uh, kids' lunches uh, delivered to Vancouver parents, knowing that parents are, have never been more busy um, and looking for ways to save time. Uh, they're more uh, used to having things delivered to their home with uh, you know, grocery delivery and meal delivery and meal kits and all those sorts of things. Um, and, and understanding that, uh, having said that, they don't want to cut corners on nutrition. And sometimes what's out there for kids, sometimes what's um, put forward in, say, the school system or even at local restaurants and things like that is hasn't necessarily evolved so much from maybe when I was a kid in terms of, you know, slice of pizza and mac and cheese and, and chicken fingers and things like that. And, and I just thought I, it didn't seem to me that it was matching the way parents were actually feeding their kids. You know, parents are reading labels, they're shopping organic and locally, and they're very curious and they're very um, switched on to their um, child's um, sensitivities, uh, allergies, things like that. So this is this is a big part of that and maybe we'll also, I'll stop here um, and if, if Kem Kennedy can uh, roll the uh, a fun little video that we've done oops do I need to stop is there Myself off mute. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, so yeah, we had we had a bit of fun with that. Uh, a friend of mine and I we made in our uh, in my kitchen till like midnight one night. My wife thought we were pretty nuts. But uh, so fundamentally, um, as I said, healthy, hassle free lunches. Uh, we are plant based, and this isn't to say that Elemento is only for uh, vegan kids or vegan families. It's really to um, acknowledge the fact that parents are incorporating more plants. They're having things like meatless Mondays, or um, they're just kind of blending or blurring the lines. It's not a, a dichotomy anymore. Um, and, and at the end of the day, I think we all could just use more plants in our diet. So uh, we thought, let's just make food that is plant-based. Um, 
allergen free is a big one for us. Um, allergens and sensitivities uh, are on the rise for kids. And the statistics are, are increasing, but also um, they under report the, the just the sort of sensitivities that kids have that maybe just, you know, a bit of stomach ache or something like that. Um, so we asked ourselves, well, why don't we just make food without those things? Like, how about we just not have dairy or, or gluten or things like that? Could we just make food that is inclusive for all that, uh, you know, the, the one child doesn't have the, you know, orange sticker on their lunch bag or something like that for the gluten free version or something. It, it just actually is some um, good, tasty food that everyone can have. And then real ingredients, you know, this isn't we, we say sort of save the lab coats uh, and beakers for science class kind of thing. Like this isn't um, so much made in a laboratory. This is just plants. This is just um, vegetables and fruits put together with some spices and, you know, uh, legumes and, and grains and things like that. This is um, fairly simple stuff at the end of the day. And, uh, and we think that that's the best way for us to present our, um, our food to, uh, to kids. And I should also say this is a, a lunch service delivered uh, to Vancouver homes, but uh, in kind of a subscription model. Uh, but we're actually looking very quickly, especially into the summer, moving into the retail space. So turning some of these products into uh, things you'd see in, in a grocery store or cafe and, and stuff like that. So that's super exciting for us. And um, yeah, we'll just sort of grow this uh, little brand uh, bit by bit. And, and what kind of prompted a lot of this was uh, a number of research that I found, but this one really jumps out at me um, and, and speaks to that first point I said around plant-based is that um, there's a large amount of people um, taking uh, willingness to, shifting their willingness to reduce meat into their um, th their weekly routine. And it's, so it's not about necessarily people becoming vegan or even vegetarian, but rather um, just understanding that uh, having um, a few days of the week or um, breakfasts or things like that to be meat free or dairy free, things like that um, have, have tremendous benefits. And we're seeing massive trends in that space. Um, I think even um, Vice President Kamala Harris uh, in the US, uh, I believe she is, um, does she, is it meat and dairy free or meat free before, uh, before dinner sort of thing. So basically she's saying like her breakfast and her lunches are vegetarian. And then at dinner, she sort of has what, whatever she likes. So um, this, we're seeing a lot of that kind of flexitarianism, I suppose. Uh, okay, so to jump into just some some sort of tips that we found in our household, um, uh, my my wife is a, um, a board certified behavior analyst. She works with um, children uh, with autism spectrum disorder and and um, builds a number of programs uh, around. Uh, around different sort of um, behavior programs and things like that. And, and some of that is around um, eating and, and um, eating programs and um, food intake and things like that. And, and so um, I think we quite naturally bring some of this into our life and, and then just um, fun ways that we've uh, really brought uh, a range of, uh, of, of mostly vegetables and, and things like that into our children's diet. Uh, so yeah. the first uh, sorry, I just want to jump in here. I know you have a beautiful presentation. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I don't, if you click um, screen share so we can see it. Again. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I? I must have. I guess when the video went. Um, sorry about that. Not a problem. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, I will. Um, here, I'll back up. I'm just going to maybe land on this one because I spoke to it, uh, but I sort of assumed everyone could see it and I wasn't going to repeat it, but I may just sit on this for 10 seconds so that people can actually read this slide. Um, um, yeah, Wait, I, I still it. can't see it. Oh, really? <laughs> what, what do I have in here? Let's try one more time. I just want to <clears> make sure that everyone has a chance to see all the beautiful slides that you've made. <laughs> Can Perfect. you see it now? That is excellent. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, thanks. First time on Zoom. So no, I'm kidding. Of course not. Probably my 400th time on Zoom. <laughs> but, um, okay. So, you know, I, I sort of touched on the, the kind of three things of plant-based, allergen-free and real ingredients. Um, yeah. I do want to maybe just um, hold on to this for 10 seconds or so uh, because I think there's some really nice data here from Statista. Um, again, just showing that, uh, and this is from 2020, so it's very current and showing that people... Um, are, are are very obviously looking to just reduce meat consumption um, in a, even partially uh, in their weekly routines. Uh, 
Uh, and then, as I said, I, I moving just sort of into some tips that we found at home um, and, and found interesting. Uh, the, the first one for me is just the earlier you can start, the better. Um, you know, you'll be, especially with young kids, you're introducing food kind of all the time. Um, so why not if you're if you're bringing, um, I don't know, meatloaf or something into the equation, why not also bring in um uh, you know, vegetables and, and other things that they're not used to. Um, you know, my wife's um, half Hungarian. We have chicken paprikash is, is, is something that uh, is a family favorite, but gets introduced um, very early. So um, at the same time, um, you know, bringing tofu or eggplant into the equation and things like that can, can, uh, can certainly be helpful. Uh, definitely starting at home, you know, they will often encounter new foods, uh, not just, well, at school potentially, um, certainly in restaurants, they'll at least see them um, around the table and things like that. And then, you know, at parent, uh, grandparents' house or um, family, friends and, and things like that, um, the more you can kind of introduce foods uh, in your own in your own place and in kind of more of a comfortable setting, uh, rather than putting pressure on them, um, I know what it can be like to take them to... Uh, you know, Nana's house and, and Nana's made something special and wants them to try it. And, uh, you know, that can often be a bit of anxiety. So um, as much as possible, just, uh, you know, think about how the, the environment that you're in uh, can certainly uh, create more exploration. Um, we always think of in terms of introducing um, certain items as uh, make it fun first. So um, popsicles, you know, uh, smoothies, pastries, things like that, taking, um, taking certain foods and making them into those types of items first before they become, maybe they show up on a dinner plate uh, in a stir fry or something like that uh, can, can be uh, pretty helpful and help to kind of get that first introduction in. Um, I like this, this sort of de-emphasize. So um, normalize is, is just the notion of um, have the food around, like don't necessarily feel that, or, or, you know, bring something new into the household or into the fridge for the first time. Um, have it sitting around. We, we often have, make sure we have like fruits and vegetables just out a lot, like just on the counter. Um, you know, we can put it back in the crisper, you know, at night and things like that, but just to sort of, um, you know, keep it top of mind and, uh, and then start to de-emphasize things. So, um, Certainly when we would make, say, um, spaghetti bolognese or something like that with uh, uh, maybe with a Beyond Meat or, um, or just vegetarian or, or something, um, we would tell them and we would tell our kids and, and things like that. But um, once we've kind of established that, we'll make um, bolognese with, I mean, sometimes it's with beef, sometimes it's with turkey, sometimes it's a Beyond Meat, sometimes it's just vegetarian. And we kind of just have de-emphasized what it is uh, because it's, we've kind of passed that point. I think you, you want to kind of aim for that where it just so happens to be something. Uh, this one sounds super uh, technical and it's, it's definitely not, but just a reminder that we eat with all of our senses. And um, actually you can use all of the senses to slowly introduce. I, I think sometimes what we do with kids is we introduce a, a food um, where it's, it's taste first. It's just put on a dinner plate and, oh, try this, try this, try this. And um, remembering there's other senses. So, you know, even starting as simply as sight. Now, I can't imagine any kid is uh, recoils at the sight of broccoli or something, but um, hopefully they don't. But, you know, again, seeing it around the house, seeing it at the grocery store, things like that. Um, smell, uh, you know, have them smell it fresh. What is a, what is a fresh um, um, versus a cooked version of something, um, what are they like? Um, touching can be very, very helpful in terms of uh, breaking down that anxiety or that barrier. So, um, and that can start at the grocery store, have them pick out um, certain items and, and choose the one on the shelf, um, you know, and touching it for firmness or, or, or softness. Um, have them help to wash or cook and um, have them serve. Even if, even if they're not ready for the item, if they are helping to serve it for mom and dad, um, again, you're just introducing those senses. Um, sound is maybe a tricky one. I don't know. You can play drums or, or try and uh, listen to the sizzle when, when if it hits the pan or something like that. Um, but just remembering that, yeah, we, we use all those senses and um, taste can, can often be uh, put at the very end of the line and, and you can kind of warm them up through these other, um, these other methods. Uh, and then and actually deconstructing, and this is something, um, and I can't speak uh, certainly as an expert to this, this is my wife's realm, but certainly in some of her food programs where there's um, sort of severe reluctance or um, 
uh, tolerance or intolerance to um, to eating certain foods, um, literally breaking it down piece by piece, which is it could be as um, simple as um, at one meal just touch the food uh, and that's it. You know, pick it up, put it down, and then the next time it's present, uh, maybe it's bringing it to your nose and smelling it and then putting it down, and then the next time it's maybe bringing it to your lips, and then the next time it's um, licking it. You know, which, you know, again, do this in the home, maybe not at a restaurant or something. Um, and then the next time, maybe it's, um, you know, take a bite and spit it out kind of thing. So you're not swallowing it. I, I know that sounds very kind of, um, but, you know, you may have, you may be in scenarios where like that type of breakdown actually can be um, extremely helpful. And uh, it allows the child to kind of move in, in a very kind of slow and steady pace toward finally um, taking one bite, eating it. Um, I think as parents, I mean, I do this, we, we often jump to that, uh, just take one bite, one bite, just one bite, you know, and, and, but that may be a really big step for some. And so maybe just putting in a step before that, you know, smell it or pick it up or, you know, something like that can be, uh, can be really helpful to get you to that first bite. This one I think is, uh, uh, I think obvious, and I'm sure everyone um, does a, a bit of this, but, you know, the more they can be involved, obviously, um, washing and cooking and even cutting and um, serving and all of those types of things um, is only going to help uh, their adoption. And, um, you know, we try and do this as much as possible at home. And then the last one is like, remember, this food should be fun and, and uh, everything kids lives should be fun, I suppose. And so gamifying this to, to some degree. Um, so we've done things like uh, blind taste tests. So especially if you have products that are, um, they're meant to try and um, kind of um, copy each other or, or be similar. Like for example, so uh, there's a, a vegan um, Caesar salad dressing that, um, that I've used. And my wife really started liking it. This is great. This is better than, you know, the regular ones. And um, so we, we started to do this kind of like taste testing with our kids and, and sort of have them. And sure enough, they chose this vegan. So now it's, it's the one that's in our house. And again, they're not vegan kids necessarily, but it's just the salad dressing that we like the most. And so um, you can have a bit of fun with that. Um, you know, you've seen on the cooking shows, they'll do things where, you know, you give one ingredient and then the chef has to make a food out of that one ingredient. Um, those are types of things you can do with your kids. I mean, even baking cookies or something and you give, you know, them something a bit unique, nutmeg or something like that. And now they've got to figure out how to uh, make cookies with that and how much to use and, and things like that. Um, it can be super fun and, and uh, it just helps them to adopt uh, new. Um, and it, I, I've been talking a lot about vegetables and things like that. I think that's often the go-to, but even like um, this can be used for adopting um, spices, bringing, you know, paprika and things like that, that, that maybe aren't necessarily spicy, but definitely, you know, have a bit of a bite to them, um, to a kid. And, and, um, so introducing those types of things into say baking, uh, can be, uh, can be really fun if, if done in, in kind of a gamified way, if you will. Uh, so there you have it. That's my little tips. And um, I'm happy to uh, take well, questions on, on those types of topics um, or LMNO as well. Uh, we have about 10 minutes here. So um, I will uh, stop Thank sharing. Thank you so much, Ryan. I, I don't have kids myself, but I did learn a lot from how to introduce them. And, you know, maybe I might even use that on my partner. <laughs> <laughs> but we actually have quite a bit of questions coming in that I would like to ask you about. Um, as you and I are talking about it, everyone listening in, please feel free to keep asking more questions and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, so first up, I'd like to ask you, what questions do you often hear most from parents about plant-based eating? You know, I think um, probably one of the first ones is around um, the uh, the kind of how much of the food is processed or again made in almost like a factory or a laboratory or or something. I think that there's a bit of a stigma around um, some of that food being bad for you, and, and frankly, some of it is. I mean, in fact, a lot of it is. I think a lot of where um, the more modern companies are going is they're they're getting away from that, but, um, there's a mass amount of education needed around that. And, um, in fact, uh, that status, uh, um, slide I showed, it's actually part of a, a really interesting deck. It's about 40 slides long. And, and one of the slides says the, the number one, um, uh, detractor, I guess, for people buying plant-based foods is, um, 
the thinking or feeling around um, processed, um, it being processed. And it's a weird, it's a weird place we've gotten to in our, uh, you know, lineage or, or something in that we're talking about plants and somehow we've like overcomplicated it by making it process. Like it, it's, it's strange that um, simply eating plants has now created a barrier because of the way they're made when really they're, you know, the most natural thing on, on earth. Um, so, you know, I think definitely reversing that and, and trying to make, um, make sure the foods we're making uh, aren't, aren't made that way, that they really are just a combination of, of the stuff you find in a, in a grocery store. Mm -hmm. And then follow up to that, I find with even my own cooking that I tend to cook vegetables and all that in the same way. And I kind of lack that inspiration. And this is actually a question from the audience is where do you find that inspiration to create new meal items? Yeah. Um, I mean, in, in a very like practical sense, um, we have a few really good cookbooks and, and happy to, to recommend some. And, um, and Instagram is, is, um, blowing up TikTok as well in terms of just kind of vegan, um, food makers and especially actually Canadian ones. Um, uh, there's one in, out of Toronto, um, her, her handle is, it doesn't taste like chicken and, uh, her Instagram, I, I think she has a, a cookbook. She's got free recipes. She's got a blog, she's got everything. And there's just amazing stuff there. That's certainly helpful. Um, but at a, from a larger point, um, I do want to kind of call out because I only became vegan in October. So it's six, seven months oh, wow. or something. Yeah. And, um, originally I thought you, you naturally think about all the things you can't have. So you, it's like, it's a reductive kind of diet or, you know, lifestyle shift or whatever, but as you move through it, you actually, it, it becomes almost additive in that you then start exploring new things. Cause to your point, I was the same way. I would make the same veggies week to week and stuff. And now I'm, I'm experimenting with different veggies. I'm experimenting with different um, spices, different ethnic spices and ways to put things together. And it's actually, I feel that in the last six months, I've like opened my array of choices. Um, even though yeah, on the surface, it may seem like I've reduced choices away from me. So would you recommend that the, is an easy avenue to change your diet? Would LMNO help with that for those who are looking to make that shift into a plant-based diet, especially for those with families? Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, the, the foods that we've tackled first are the ones um, like, so I interviewed about um, nearly 200 parents last summer um, to kind of land on this. And, and I tested the foods with um, about 20 to 30 parents and things like that. Um, and, and what we asked them what their most favored and loved foods were. Um, and it, it, we haven't hit all of those on our menu. It's a pretty small menu where we've just launched, but um, our aim was to take existing foods, not to necessarily like foods that kids typically would have in a lunch. And uh, so take like a mac and cheese like thing, take a wrap, take sushi, which is um, actually the number one thing. P parents were like, sushi is their favorite, their kids' favorite really? food. So that's, that's yeah, great. I found that interesting. Totally. Um, so, so, you know, we, we, we felt that that was a, a good first step before introducing something entirely new to them. Uh, so I do think that that's a, that's an interesting way to, to start to shift things where you haven't changed the dish. You just change the ingredient makeup of that dish, um, by something like what Elemento offers. And then there's a follow-up for questions that the folks that are purchasing, um, from Elemento, how does the food stay fresh for the whole week? Yeah. So one of, one of the really interesting insights I had um, talking to parents was that they, they didn't want to replace um, making lunches all week that, you know, there's, there's leftovers in the fridge so they can use that, or they might have special things that they love to make their child. Um, you know, they just want a break. They just want like, can I just unwind tonight and not have to make dinner or lunch for tomorrow? Um, and so this really helped me kind of land on a model that uh, it's only delivered for one, like one day a week. And it's, it's, um, and, uh, and it gives parents that one day a week. It's also, I'll admit it's, it's priced at kind of a premium level. It's, it's meant to be, um, it's, it's healthier. It's all these, these things. Um, 
but you know, I, I don't think it's priced in a way that somebody would realistically buy it five days a week. Um, so it is kind of meant to be delivered in the evening and then used the next day. Uh, we are experimenting with morning delivery and whether we can like do that. Obviously it's a tight window and if we're late, we've really messed things up. So <laughs> we're, we're being careful. Um, and then secondly, when I mentioned about getting into retail and, and um, grocery stores and things like that, we're experimenting with some of these. Um, my chef right now is actually working on creating versions um, that are easily frozen uh, or kind of deconstructed in a way where it's a simple um, put together. And that, that type of um, presentation could be something you could buy for a whole week or, you know, even two weeks worth and put in the freezer and take out and things like that too. I'm, I'm so excited to see that progress and come into the stores. So how yeah. do you accommodate those with allergies and food restrictions in your products? Yeah. So, you know, like an amazing sort of beautiful story from a friend of mine who whose um, daughter um, has a gluten allergy, a dairy allergy, and, and just as, as at a real rough go, um, you know, with stomach issues. And, um, and he just said to me, he goes, you know, the difference between going somewhere and saying, here's what you can have, or here's what you get. And it's like, one or two things on a menu uh, that, that she can choose from or one or two things in the display window or something versus going somewhere where he, he can say, what would you like? You know, he, the, the, all of this is, is available to you. And that really changed my thinking about how, how we present this and, and really did challenge me in, in the fall to actually reconstruct the menu away from um, I know a lot of places definitely allow for substitutions and changes and things like that, but I, I wanted to be different. I wanted to just make things that didn't have those um, eight common allergens um, or eight most, the big eight, they call them. Uh, and I just challenged us to try and make foods that just don't have, um, say, gluten and things like that. And that doesn't mean that we're using like gluten-free bread because gluten-free bread doesn't taste the greatest. Um, so instead we're like, well, then let's not use bread. Let's, let's talk about it or, or a tortilla. Let's move to a corn tortilla instead of a, you know, it's like I'm thinking things through and, and only choosing foods that can be naturally inclusive um, and, and away from those big eight. If you look on our menu right now, we're like 99% there. There's a few things we're like tweaking to get them just right um, so that we could fully say they're 100% allergen free. And there's actually quite a bit of questions that I'm receiving that they want to know what type of food is in there. So where can they find your menu? Yeah. So elemento.co, um, elemento underscore co is the Instagram. Um, and yeah, I mean, I would say the hit right now is um, the macadoodle, which is um, it's, it's a, let's call it a mac and cheese, if you will, but it's not cheese. It's, it's basically made with herbs and nutritional yeast and lots of vegetables and, um, I was surprised that that one was going to be the hero. I really like sushi. I mean, I like them all, but you know, um, but every parent is like, uh, I mean, we have like little quotes, um, from parents saying like, this is my daughter's favorite meal of the week. Like she just loves it. And, and again, I just want to emphasize like, these aren't vegan kids. I think one of our customers is, is like a true vegan family. Um, the rest are just like, no, it tastes great. And I know I'm giving them something healthy. Um, so it's a win for us and, and the child doesn't even like know or care that it's, it's technically vegan. We have people tuning in from all over Canada. So is this something that they can order in different provinces? Is it just in BC? Um, how can they access and support LMNO? Um, and you know, what? I want to add one more quick thing to the last question because I'm absolutely I'm so absolutely. Um, I'm so smitten with this one thing. Uh, but it's it's like even for the sides, we have this thing called we have like a couple of, like the key is to make these things fun too. Um, we have something called buried treasure where it's literally some berries. It's just berries, and then there's like a gummy bear hidden underneath. Like it's just that simple, but it's fun. And um, we have these Zelda bombs, which are just like these kind of like energy bomb things. Um, and there's just like a wick, a little like coconut wick, and it, it kind of looks like you know from Nintendo days. Or um, anyway, so you know we try and do that kind of thing. And and some of those products, like a like a Macadoodle or a Zelda bomb, um, the goal is, I mean, you know, in, in the intro, it said that I want to make sort of the the next great or the great um, kids plant based 
based food brand. And, and that to me means national coverage. Um, so whether it's a, it's a lunch delivered service across the country, uh, maybe, I mean, I, I wonder if maybe that's only for kind of Vancouver, or the surrounding area, but the products that show up in stores, I, that's the goal is really to take this. Um, Cause I don't think there's a ton of plant-based food going out there, but none of it's like focus fully on kids. And um, especially from a meal point of view, there's like snacks and treats, but not so much um, actual like meal type things. Um, so yeah, I, I, I want this to show up across uh, the country, no doubt. Oh, that is so, so great. I could listen and chat with you all day about this. This is something that I'm so excited to see develop. And I hope all, everyone listening today that you follow and check out Element O's website. I am so, one of the things that I love to hear was all the different names. Yeah. It just made food more fun for myself. But right now we're sadly out of time. Yes. And I thank you so much, Ryan McKee, for joining us today and sharing all of your stories and the story of Elemento. Um, yeah. And so with that, I would like to conclude our first session of day seven of the last seven days of seaweed. And I would also like to thank again, Jennifer Clark, for joining us for this two for one, two for one great session today. Um, and I hope to see you all joining us in the next sessions throughout the day today. Thanks so much, everyone.